Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Scott Harris, and you do know me. Um, and I'd like to introduce our guests, um, Bruce Van Marle from the Orbis Institute, Peter DeYoungs. Peter DeYoungs? Yep. From the Orbis Institute, Johnny Stockdale from Royal Northern College of Music. Um, Howard and Paul are also going to contribute to the discussion today, which is really looking at learning and teaching in research higher degrees. Um, Bridie gave us the, the um, topic of learning and teaching, and we've added the research higher degrees. And then as the list of international guests increased over the semester, we decided to add local and global perspectives. <laughs> um, so it's been organic from the start and continues to be. Uh, I'd like to just set the scene a little by reading something from the Polyphonia project in which the gentleman has been involved. Um, and it's something that um, Paul and Stephen Emerson and I have looked at in interrogating our own doctoral process here. And the um, Polyphonia project says in part, the concepts, the technical terms and their related distinctions, assumptions and theories that are handed down to us by traditional disciplines do not necessarily reflect the way musicians experience and think about their art. Programs may provide a suitable platform for young musician researchers to develop their own concepts that are truer or a better reflection of their own perceptions and thoughts. Young researchers may be encouraged to actively influence the world of music research and to determine the research discourses as they see fit and not as they are told to see fit. This is always the advice for supervisors rather than students. Some of you may say, well, you're telling us to do things this way, and we're not going to do that anymore if you're belonging to the student's cohort. Now, for me, this raises the question, how do we create an atmosphere, and this is us as an institution, in which research can flourish through the integration of what we do in the research centre, its projects, its resources and its expertise, through the interaction of and the retention and supervision of students so that we create this environment where we do make a contribution to knowledge in this area. I'm going to ask um, Hal to lead off and to make um, just a, a very brief statement about um, his view on this and, and what we've done here to create this atmosphere of research for uh, both staff researchers and for student researchers and then we'll move on to our guests. I didn't say you were going to go first. Okay, thank you very much. We voted. That's what's going to happen. Well, first of all, let me reinforce what Scott was saying. We're delighted to have uh, our international visitors with, with us. Uh, Peter Dionzo goes from Ireland, and I've been having many uh, a discussion over excellent food in Belgium and in Italy uh, on what the nature of, of artistic practices research is. And we're decided that we're not going to resolve in order to continue to be having uh, food and, and, and drinks. Uh, these are things you don't want to resolve too quickly. Um, don't see many of you will know um, from uh, his time when he was uh, running music at, uh, at VCA, and now he's returned to his um, native country running the Royal Northern uh, College of Music, which has striking similarities with us in, in, in many ways. The, 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 I think the ethos of the place is very, very similar to us, and um, we are discussing further collaborations as we are with, with Peter and, and Joost. So that's the formal, uh, the formal part of it. Uh, in terms of the contents uh, that, that you raise, uh, Scott, I think many of us here are kind of an embodiment of the research, the approach we've been taking to, to, uh, to research in uh, the higher education environment. When I came here in 2003, there was sort of a, a very mild fear that, oh my God, you are getting a professor and he'll probably force us to read books about music and write journal articles because all the music that we're making doesn't make any sense. And what I found instead uh, was that there was a great opportunity to turn all the thinking that was happening already about, about music making, reflective practice, um, interesting projects that, 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 that push the boundaries of, of how we perceive music and, and, and music making. We're a very, very thankful subject of, of, of research from people reflecting on it and writing full-scale 80,000 words PhDs or uh, journal articles to people having the majority of, the, of their thinking reflected in, in actual sound and artistic products. And I think that would be one of the very interesting things that we can discuss today to what extent, um, and we had the discussion in the corridor just now, to what extent a uh, 100% artistic uh, um, submission for a research higher degree 
would ever be acceptable or whether it will always need the 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 or 50,000 words of, of, of exegesis in order to, to make clear why it is research. And of course the, the success we've had here, and that's something which, is, which, which comes many, many years after the, the, it, it was uh, successful in Britain, that we now can sub submit artistic product into, uh, to the government as research outputs and will be judged on them on uh, at least in principle equal footing with uh, people that, that submit journal articles and books. I think is a major, major step forward in, in where we are and uh, I'd like to have the illusion that the work we've been doing here by not by just saying every time you open our violin case it's research, by, by saying we are ready to look at what is the research component of the artistic work that we do and we're ready to make that explicit and to, to, to the outside world has contributed to that. That was a very long and complicated sentence. At the end of my yes, thank well you. Well done, it's to the time now. Yeah. Um, I wonder if we might throw to you now, Paul, because one of the things that you've done in, in the last couple of days particularly is to bring together some of the um, issues around our doctorate and the programs that you guys are running, so perhaps that will be a, a useful segue into the more. Um, yes, we had an opportunity to catch up with Houston, Roost, and Peter yesterday. We uh, had an opportunity to catch up with John here, so I'll be interested to see if there's any parallels. But I guess the way I went into thinking about it was um, quite a lot of background looking at the work and reading some material, and I thought yeah. that would probably be a very different context to here. And we're just arriving at first generation Doctor of Musical Arts students. June Penny is our first graduation. And then I was thinking about the European context and the school and imagining all sorts of things. And um, actually, the more we looked at it, the more we talked. It, it felt like we had a lot in common. But also, a lot of your work being uh, well, first generation, you could say, and still poking around about this thing about what. Uh, what exegesis might look like and how might go about it and what artistic practice as through in all these various terms we've been grappling with to try and understand what it was. So um, I found that quite enlightening that actually there was a lot of the same issues. And I guess the other, the other bit of context is these, the Orpheus Institute are involved with in an interesting kind of consultancy the best things I can make of it, consultancy collaboration with all these other universities that produce doctoral degrees. So the universities <coughs> brand their degrees and graduate people, but they come to the centre as almost a neutral research partner, uh, which is an interesting kind of setup. It kind of made me think about what a node of a centre of excellence in Australia might look like in that context. So that was, I thought that was interesting. Um, and also, given all those amazing partners in Europe, <coughs> they came all the way here to see us. That was extraordinary. <laughs> very pleased about that because obviously they're, they're interested in models and what people are doing and what our issues are. And, and the last, the last bit I wanted to say was I, I read this book last night, which is uh, just out in. Well, it's a, it's an, I read this last night, and I've read. The, very quickly, and I've read the first two chapters about three times now, because I, I think, actually, the more I look at it, I think it's completely breathtaking. I think it's the best thing I've ever read in this area. I just think it's extraordinary. And um, I sent an email around with the link, but I, I suggested that RHD students really might want to read this, because um, if I were doing a, a doctorate in DNA, I think there's so much in there philosophically, philosophically, artistically, and practically that would really be helpful help you situate where you are in relation to the work, where the artist is in relation to the work, particularly the first and last chapter. It's written by uh, three postdocs, one's in arts, and this is a conversation we had yesterday about art and design being so much more well developed in terms of this discussion and music being quite new in terms of this discussion. And uh, so they've, they've teamed up three postdoc professors, um, fairly incredible backgrounds, one's from art and design, one's from music and the other one of philosophy and music. And uh, that's the threads that run through it. I think it's terrific. So the more I read that, the more I sort of thought they were the same kinds of things I'm hearing in discussions with uh, students, etc. So it's good for me. It's an intro. Excellent. I will briefly start by 
by introducing um, our institute, which is the smallest music institution in Europe and probably in the world. It's not dealing with bachelors and masters, it's only focusing on what's coming after, after the, the masters. And um, it was founded by the Flemish government in 96 and is based in Ghent. And Ghent is in Flanders and Flanders in Belgium. In Belgium. <laughs> the Netherlands are a part of great <laughs> and um, it, so it was funded in, in 1996 and our, by the Ministry of Education and the minister himself said at that moment I don't know what you are but I know what you are not and what you are not is a conservatoire, bachelor and master, and you are not a university. So, somewhere in the gray, the gray zone between a conservatoire and a university. And that, at that time we had to define what we wanted to organize for music students. And at that time in Europe, at least in continental Europe, there was no way of thinking about doctoral degrees for musicians, at least not in our country and in the countries around. And there were some exceptions, like Sibelius Academy in, in Finland and some East, former East European uh, uh, cities, but in, in global you could say it, it was an exception. So we didn't dare to start about thinking on research because research at that time was an infected word that related to what is going on was and is going on in universities. So we said we wanted to, we wanted to position ourselves on the crossroads of practice, musical practice, and reflection, reflection on that practice by musicians, by the artists. So we started off with a program, a laureate, it was called a laureate program. And now I jump to to the year 2004, where we started with doctoral program, and that was because a university in, in I must admit, it's hard to admit, but it, it was in the <laughs> Netherlands, uh, and there was a, a university in Leiden, and Leiden University decided to create a new faculty called the Faculty of Creative and Performing Arts, and so there was a legal structure to organize doctoral studies and a doctoral degree for musicians, but there was no experience. At that time they said, look, let's visit Office Institute. They have some, ex some experience in organizing this, this research avant la lettre, because it was not called like that at that moment. So, to make it short, we decided to work together with The Hague Conservatoire, Leiden University, Amsterdam Conservatoire, and organizing all together with Office Institute in Ghent a doctor program that would lead to a doctoral degree at Leiden University, which was which was the university that accepted to award this degree to musicians, and in combination with these conservatoires or music schools, if you want. That was in 2004. So we have now five years, and we will have at the end of this year, in December, we will have our first uh, student. Uh, finishing his, his doctoral work. So, there were reasons to work together. First of all, there's the, the phenomenon of having, of the need for having a critical mass of students, but also critical mass of supervisors, critical mass of research resources like libraries, for example. So there were many reasons to work together. And in 2000 and Seven, we decided to, to, to turn our program, which was a Dutch spoken program, into an international one. And so we decided also to open up a collaboration and we got some smaller funding from the European uh, Commission or Union to start with a new design for doctor studies, a curriculum. And the partnership was with um, the institutions already involved in our doctor program, and that was that is still called 
talk after this, our doctor program. And we changed that name for the sake of European things and funding into, just for the sake of three years, into the name DOCUMA, Doctor Curriculum in Music Arts, which we were funded for. And we decided to work together with some UK-based partners, Oxford University, Royal College of Music in London, and Royal Holloway University of London. We ended this program recently, so we have now a, an English, an international um, doctor curriculum, and you could say that Orpheus functions actually as a kind of international, inter-university doctoral school, because meanwhile we also work together with a Flemish university, Leuven University, so we actually bring together students from different partners in one program, we bring them together for the curriculum the first two years of their doctor trajectory, ten times a year, every month, every month two or three consecutive days. They work together, There's, we can, later on we can be very specific, specific about it, but I only have five minutes, but as you, uh, as you didn't use them all, I can take over some of your minutes. <laughs> That's Which how we behave. Typical thing. <laughs> <laughs> we give them our left over. <laughs> and um, the main mission of this curriculum is to create a research environment. That is quite difficult. That is it. We can discuss about what, what it then should be, a research environment. But we think that when we start with Old Face Institute and with this doctor program later on, what we actually are missing is a discourse, a, dis a, disc a research discourse between musicians, or musician slash researchers. In our, in our program, we do not make distinctions between, for example, early music and contemporary music, or between composers and performers. We bring all these musicians together, and we discuss, and we, we let them give presentations, and we invite guest professors, and we have our workshops in these two or three days amongst monthly, uh, um, monthly themes that are more or less things, general things relating to music, like notation, or analysis, or listening. Phenomena or actions that are shared by all kinds of music, musicians and that do not relate to specific trends or styles. To give you an example, we now have um, eight, we have eight doctor students in the first year, seven in the second year, but we do not make a difference between first and second, so they sit together, the 15, 15 we have. We accepted eight last September, and we are now recruiting from all over the world. We have 36 candidates from all over the place, and <clears throat> we select them um, through, first of all, a, a a dossier, a written, written dossier they have to send in and then interview and pres oral presentation they have to give. And then from this 36 we came to eight candidates and I would say the general or the way we accept or the reasons why we accept is or why we don't accept is that we want to bring together those research questions that have a strong and genuine relationship with the view of an artist on, on a musician, in our case, on his or her practice. So we, if we, we have a, a very short definition of what artistic research might be. It's a, a working definition, and it helps. It is. Artistic research is research where the artist makes the difference. It's research, and research that has to comply to, to, the, to the normal criteria of what research is. It's an original contribution to knowledge, but it is knowledge that is created by an artist 
by a musician. And the qualification of being a musician, musician is not enough. You have to formulate your research question so that you bring in the perspective of your being an artist. So you bring in your artistry. So artistic research is research where the artist makes the difference. If you cannot comply to that definition, but you might be for example, an artist and you have a wonderful research question, but it is more or less, say, a musicological one, then we say no. Not because the research question is not valid, but we are not the place <coughs> for that kind of research environment. So we cannot give bonus added to that question. That is, our, I think, very short, shortly what we <coughs> organize in terms of doctoral, doctoral studies or doctoral, uh, doctoral curriculum. So we do not award the degree ourselves. Office Institute is a doctoral school, you might say. It's not officially, but it is, you could say, avant la lettre, an international inter-university doctoral school. It might be that later on other universities will join, or other conserved ones. Apart from our doctoral program, we also have lots of activities, conferences, workshops, seminars that are offered to all professional musicians that are interested in, you might see it as a kind of lifelong learning possibilities that people come back to us and and, and, and then apart from that we started uh, quite recently with a research center and Joost van Mala, my colleague, he's the coordinator of the research, research center. He will tell more about that, just briefly introducing it. We, as I priorly said that we are interested in creating a research environment for musicians, a doctor creating or designing a doctoral uh, curriculum is a tool to create a research environment. But that's only one tool and that is not enough. It's a tool where you are working more or less receptively. You accept students with their research question and they will leave after a certain period. We also wanted to contribute to the field of knowledge itself by producing artistic research. And that is why we started with a research center that is funded by the Ministry of Innovation and uh, Science. It's a very small bit, uh, budget, but I can think we can, we start with it and I hand over to Joost who will so good afternoon, everyone. Um, briefly, uh, thank you, Peter, for introducing the institute. And maybe I will briefly situate the, the Orpheus Research Center in Music, which we call for family and friends ORCI, um, uh, within the global activities of the Orpheus Institute. So, as, a, as an institute for advanced studies and research in music, we, as uh, Peter already mentioned, uh, a primary function is education. Having we have a low grade program and afterwards came there the doctoral curriculum for uh, doctoral students and we also organized workshops and uh, master classes and all these kind of things. Another um, uh, function of the Office Institute is that it acts as a forum internationally of bringing people together and, and discussing uh, 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 topics that are relevant to these partners in order to, to create a, a kind of place where everyone can uh, contribute to, to, to the discourse on artistic research. But, as Peter also already mentioned, having a doctoral program at all individual research, this is, a, this is a kind of a parallel working where everyone has his own uh, uh, question, challenge, or urge for innovation. And these research projects, they, they start and they end, hopefully. And there, there's not always a continuation or, 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 or an accumulation or situation of knowledge uh, 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 possible. Another thing is that well, apparently there is a phenomenon of artistic research. People do it, but it's I think the, the transition from uh, uh, artistic research as a phenom phenomenon to artistic research as a discipline. I think that's a, a transition that is that is still to be uh, worked on and, and still uh, uh, under the way. Another thing in the, in the doctoral curriculum is that you see that a lot of doctoral students. When, when having a certain question, the first thing they do is go into other disciplines. 
this is kind of the hunter-gatherer strategy. When, when you have, uh, you are hungry, you go somewhere in the woods looking for things and you bring them home. And I think the transition from, from a hunter-gatherer strategy to a, an agricultural uh, 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 society, so we ask now money from the Minister for Agriculture. <laughs> he still has to buy it. Uh, the, um, that where you can have your own concepts that can grow within your own garden and when people have a question they can look there for, for certain answers or, or uh, things that can, can uh, address their question. I think that that's a transition that we all um, uh, also envisage and uh, in short, as Peter said, an environment where, where individual research can, uh, can be situated within a global, uh, uh, more generic en environment and uh, where is the possibility for, for um, the accumulation of knowledge. And that therefore, we created a more stable constituent within this very, uh, I can still say, maybe over 10 years will be another situation, but a very uh, um, unstable environment of artistic research that's still a very exploratory stadium, especially in the So that, in the middle, is the research center that connects in various ways to these, to these other uh, missions that Orpheus uh, uh, Institute incorporates. So the Orpheus Research Center in Music, what's the mission is the creation of a research environment for artistic research or what we call, and I'm, I'm sorry that, that we come in the, again into the in and the true, and, but research in and through musical practice. But it's for a very pragmatical reason, because um, if we say that uh, research has, has to be a contribution to knowledge and understanding, to the creation of new possibilities, in, in uh, artistic uh, practice than, than the questions, of course, and we, as, as uh, the research center in music, office research center in music, want to contribute to that. How will we do that? And what, what, or what will happen? And what is this um, a tactical uh, plan uh, in order to, to fulfill that mission? So, the first thing that we, and I think there's something strange, here, but okay, the S by deconstructing the, the term research in and through uh, uh, musical practice. First, research in practice. What well, is the source, and that's why it's something that was mixed up in, 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 in research and through musical practice, the source domain where the problems, the urge for innovation, the challenges emerge, the, that source domain is artistic practice. But it's also the target domain. By doing research, we want to contribute to that same field of uh, artistic practice. So it's research and practice. That's not a domain that we uh, exclusively uh, occupy. There are other, other disciplines that are interested in it. But that's also our domain, research in musical uh, practice. And if you consider musical practice as being, uh, as, as is done in, 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 uh, in uh, practice theory, as an array of interconnected activities that are underpinned by, by or implicit or explicit shared understandings and are committed to the production of music in our case, of, of musical art, then you, you could visualize it as, as, as such a thing. But research center, we have to have a systematic approach, I think, to if we want to start, we, we need a kind of uh, a tactical plan on how, how to do that. For, for these reasons, for reasons of systematization and being aware of the interconnectedness of all these things, we chose to to single out certain of these activities that seem to us very prominent following our experience in the doctoral program that seem to connect people from early music to contemporary music, uh, uh, music pedagogues to uh, uh, performers to composers. And so we singled out five principal research areas. The first being listening, musicians listening. I think it's quite an important element in music. Uh, analyzing the musicians, analyzing, creating the musicians act of creation, which is a rather bigger domain. Notation, the musicians related to notation, and sound works related more to the material that we uh, work with. So these were the principal uh, uh, research areas. But again, what is the question then? If we want to create a discourse and a human layer for artistic research where can people can benefit from it, I can also situate their knowledge within that. Contribution to knowledge, opening new possibilities. The question, of course, of uh, one million dollars is how to do that. And there we, uh, our, our approach is a one that is based on the, on the other part of the term research in and through musical practice, 
we do research in the field of musical practice, the activities shared and so on, but we do that through musical practice. And that's the specificity, uh, that's the kind of the distinction between our the approach of artistic research or research and musical practice and other approaches, the, the ones from music psychology, sociology, philosophy, or performance studies even. That, that's that's another, uh, another perspective. And more concretely, how, how can you do that? I refer you to an article by Aslo, Aslo Nunes um, that was, I think, um, 2006, Lighting from the Side was published in a series of Sentience Knowledge. And each year there's in Bergen a conference on artistic research. And she, she developed the idea that in every artistic uh, research project, there is an interaction between three languages. She says there's the material language. It's the language of, of the thing that you work with, the sounds that you work with. There's the personal language. That's not always an, a, a symbolic language, but also embodied language, the language of your, your movement repertoire as a, as a flutist, as a, as a percussionist, as a pianist, the things that you, that you work and learn. And there's a theoretical language that is, uh, of, sometimes offers a context, but also often acts as a mediator for, for instance, articulating these embodied understandings. And she says these three always are always more or less present in an artistic research project, and they interact in specific ways. And she says it's also a method. You go from one place, one topos, she called it, to another. And, and from that, from this unique combination where, the, for instance, the material, the, the, the relation with the material is an essential part, you have another position than, than for instance, in, in, in other research. Taking this as a, as a point of departure, Again, for reason of systematization, we developed three approaches to uh, 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 explore that field of artistic uh, practice as an area of activities. First, an approach by experimentation. Second approach, embodied understandings. Third approach, thoughts and concepts. And it's more, again, the systematization is, uh, works in the, in the way that these things are always interconnected, but in certain research projects, there's a kind of, are gravitating to certain uh, elements. Certain uh, research projects, they start with thoughts and concepts. They say, they read Adorno, for instance, and they find the, 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 um, the, the concept of truth, for instance, and they see how does it work in, in musical performance. There comes an experimentation phase where from that follows an embodied understanding that has to be maybe, uh, again, articulated by using certain theoretical language, or that comes to, uh, to thoughts and, and concepts by it. Or other research projects, they really start with the, with, uh, with the material. As, for instance, I witnessed uh, this morning in, in your presentation, where working with a tone, what can you do? And, and instrument, that's a really uh, a very good example of, of working, uh, uh, experimenting and working uh, with the material. And so there's also uh, always a gravitation. And if you, uh, combine these two, uh, for, and in our research center, for instance, on experimentation, we have people that work very much with Cage, Nolan, and Feldman, and so they they will produce research in the coming years on, on that uh, element. Thoughts and concepts, Adorno, Deleuze, and James seem to be important within our research center and within the work that the doctoral students and also the post students mm -hmm. do, and some of it is already to be found in the, in the artistic term. And the embodied understandings are embodied in our research models. So if you combine these elements, you get the kind of, and that's the, the, the most difficult part for our researchers and musicians, you get a kind of a grid where you can have, where you can, where you can situate knowledge, but also uh, uh, benefit from certain things that are uh, pr primarily present. Because if every, every research project works on thoughts and concept, uh, on, on uh, thoughts and concept, embodied understanding and experimentation, it is a present in every uh, a, a research project, creating an environment is trying to make these topoi bigger and richer in a way within our own uh, discipline. So we have in fact, in fact three uh, 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 approaches, experimentation and musical practice, embodied understanding and musical practice, thoughts and, and, and musical practice. So what is the status of this environment? First, it's an attractive framework. If you consider in, the, in dynamic system theory, uh, artistic research as, a, as in, in chaos theory, as a chaos, then uh, from that the dynamic system, uh, certain, certain attractors will appear. And I think these emerge by our experience in the doctoral uh, uh, program and in, our, uh, in general, that certain things seem to be prominent within this field. It also is a generative framework in, in several uh, ways. 
I, I did this this morning, I, I hope this works, uh, in a horizontal way. For instance, if you take notation as a point of departure, as we do in a seminar in April on music and the score, you can invite several people to reflect on that, on that element, and, and then they call this from the experiment, experimental approach, embodied understandings approach, or the thoughts and concepts approach, and then you can get a kind of rich contribution to that domain. There's also a possibly, possi possibility for a vertical approach. If you start from thoughts and concepts, and you see how they relate to certain activities, it could be a possibility. And there's also the possibility for a kind of rhizomatically, uh, rhizomatic approach, where you have some interest in a topic that's, that doesn't belong here, but that you draw on several uh, elements, therefore, and also contribute to, to these elements. Um, it's, all, it's essentially a tool for organizing the research within ORCID, and it gives also for us a kind of identity of what we are really uh, trying to do. This is a kind of, generally, uh, again, about these um, uh, thoughts and, and concepts and experimentation. I think the, the term research in a true music practice, if the blue uh, circle is, or it's an oval, um, is musical uh, practice. This, is, this doesn't have a symbolic meaning about uh, musical practice. Um, there are ways of enriching and contributing, I think. One way is you take things, thoughts and concepts coming from outside and they go through musical practice and afterwards something has changed. Something has, yeah, it's, it's amateur <coughs> design, I, I'm very, very sorry. Um, so that, that's a possibility for an enrichment. There is also a possibility from working from being an, a practitioner and having embodied understandings but trying to articulate them or working uh, with them so that you can have certain points within musical practice that become more explicit or, or, or more uh, um, articulated. Or there's also by experimentation that just don't kind of respect the boundaries of artistic practice, but try to, to develop it further and, and to expand these boundaries by experimentation. And there's a, I think there's a kind of a general logic. It's not new. It's, it's ways, I think, of enriching, us, of making contribution. And these are embedded more or less in the framework that we uh, the general framework that we uh, propose, and that now, of course, demands for more punctual, because this is stra strategic, tactical uh, 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 program. But now we have we are in the process of taking concrete actions, concrete projects. We also invite other research centers that are interested in, in contributing in one way uh, or another to to help, because this is, of course, an amazing work. But I think it will it's worthwhile, and we uh, look uh, very much forward to the future and in this. And I think I've seen it my own it's fine. Sorry for that. No, it's absolutely fine. Um, John, do you have something to offer? Yeah, well, I'm more than. Well, in a sense, I feel compelled to say something because I. <laughs> 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 well, when this question came up for this session today, I, I wondered quite what the question was about because actually I think we're. The context that I've been in has been a rather privileged one, I think, in the context of some of the things that I've been reading and what you've been saying today, because I think, however you alluded to this earlier, that in the UK perhaps we've been in a different place with regard to the whole matter of practice-based research study. Um, I did a practice-based research doctorate in 1986 in composition. And when I'm reflecting back on that, and now looking at what the issues are, you know, the questions that are on the table here today, that was a submission, a portfolio of compositions where each work had a research question behind it, in effect. So it was following that model that was uh, asked by the university of how are you demonstrating as a composer that you're contributing to new knowledge that you're actually adding to our understanding. And I wasn't the first student to do the practice-based doctorate in comp composition. I was, I was probably, I'd followed 10 years of students doing practice-based PhDs in the institution where I did it. So actually, it, we're going back into the early 70s and perhaps even earlier than that. Now, there might have been something unique about the institution I was at, but it was the University of York in the UK. And if, if you know anything about that institution, it's had a, a very alternative model to education and training, both at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Um, the undergraduate curriculum, uh, for what it is, actually, is extremely loose. And in fact, there is no particular sense of uh, level progression in that program. Students progress from one year to another in a three-year undergraduate degree. 
but students at first year level choose uh, options. The, the entire curriculum is based on the idea of options. So you go into the first year and you might take an option that a second year student is taking at the same time that a third year student is taking. So you'd have third years, second years and first years in the same room taking an option but being assessed at different levels based on their particular uh, 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 developmental position. Um, so this is an institution that also had a, uh, a perspective on postgraduate study and particularly at doctoral level, where effectively there was no curriculum. There was, there was nothing other than the artists, in effect, in this environment. So I was slightly thrown when I turned up to this institution um, as a student with expectations of a, of a program to be told, go away and compose, in effect. That is what you will do over the next three years of your study in this institution. So there was... There was no research techniques, there was no guided learning. It really was, I suppose you could call it a, a black hole, a vacuum. But actually, it became the most creative space that I ever had as an artist because you had to define the parameters around yourself as an artist. There, there was nothing coming at you saying, you need to express yourself in this particular way, you need to couch your knowledge and understanding within this framework. You were literally an artist in isolation. And that model still exists in that institution, and it's fairly widespread in institutions generally in the UK. Now. There are many uh, universities where you can do a practice-based PhD program where either as a performer or as a composer or as an improviser, which is effectively a halfway house between, you know, between the two, uh, you are largely assembling a body of work. And then principally on the Viva Voce, and not especially through thesis, uh, defending that work to a panel of examiners, experts, whatever you might call it. And that, that, the fact that that has been existing in the UK for such a period of time has also influenced the way that um, research is regarded when it comes to funding. I think probably at the time that York University established this PhD in composition, where effectively the traditional rule book was torn up. Composition, practice-based research, wasn't being regarded as research for the purposes of uh, evaluating research output in our uh, assessment exercises. But I think it was in 1995 when there was a bit of a change, and then in 2001 particularly, when practice-based research was regarded as legitimate research alongside effectively text-based research publishing of monographs, articles in learned journals. Compositions and performance were regarded on equal terms. And if you know anything about the outputs, uh, the way that they were measured, particularly in 2001, I think, was that um, performers and composers in conservatoires and universities were ranked equally al alongside their colleagues who were producing monographs and uh, articles in the journals purely for their artistic output. There was no requirement to explain that work in other terms, other than in, in the sense of the work, the fact that the work existed. Unfortunately, well, and maybe there are some good in this, um, that didn't persist, because actually what happened was that the conservatoires particularly did exceptionally well in that environment, because they were publishing a huge amount of output in effect. If uh, the equivalent of the publication was a recording on a, a prestigious label or a performance in a renowned concert hall, that, and the criteria was a hall, that, uh, a hall in which you would receive PRS royalties if you had that work performed in that hall. So that was the equivalent of sort of peer evaluation of the quality of that, of, of that work. Because I think the conservatoires did so well, but they didn't articulate exactly what the research was that was embedded in this work. There was a bit of a sea change in the future exercise. And we now find ourselves in a position where uh, actually we've rode back a little bit from the position of allowing PhDs simply by the submission of the creative work itself to this requirement that there has to be some contextual thesis that supports that work, that articulates and contextualizes the creative work that is in the portfolio itself. And I was just reflecting on where we are at the RNCM on this. And, I mean, we have 
doctorates in musicology, music psychology, performance, and com composition. And I was just reflecting on how, for example, the Doctor of Philosophy and Composition referred to that experience that I related to you earlier, the one that I had at York University, and it is still principally by the submission of a substantial portfolio of composed work. But there is a requirement for a thesis of around the order of 20,000 words. Now, that's still quite small. Like you would normally do a thesis of that size, perhaps for a research master's. But this is the requirement that we have in the UK, and I think that's fairly standard these days. So, this, the, on, on the one hand, what you're describing here is, is a sort of a, 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 a frontier in the context in which you find yourselves. And yet, in my context, it seems that we've, uh, we're in a very, very different place. Um, the only other thing I would say, and, and, and it's about the question that was coming up today, was about learning and teaching in research higher degrees. Um, there is principally no curriculum still, as far as I'm aware, in uh, research higher degrees at doctoral level in the UK. The closest we get to this, um, and I think you find this in Australia also, is um, the introduction of this, um, students taking research training in research meth methodologies. But that's as far as it goes. Um, there is no other learning and teaching component. And it, but it, is pre it is based on this idea that we're looking at the artist as an individual who is asking questions about the world around them and manifesting those questions or addressing those questions through their artistic output. So there's a huge, in a sense, it feels to me a huge amount of trust and openness, actually, in this very question, in the context from which I've come from. So that's why I found the question rather puzzling, actually. But uh, I appreciate in other parts of the world, you may be dealing with very different obstacles. Um, Do you want to pick up on that? Yeah. Something particularly that uh, try and process this that stood out immediately because every conversation here, <coughs> yes, for longest established PhD in this country is composition. Yeah. There's a product, and the most well researched areas in practice based research seem to know they have products, art and designs, fifth, seventh generation examples because they make things. So, actually, what I'm specifically interested in this conversation for various reasons is. What does a performing arts PhD look like? And let's dig down. We're talking about people that don't compose, yeah. but play canon. And I think this is a very important piece here because it seems like the only way they have to express is a thesis. And it seems to me that there's a certain amount of reticence or um, lack of confidence about what you would actually do as a performing musician. And the other extreme that is, I'm, I'm not particularly in favour of submitting digital works as proxies for various reasons, unless they're actually artworks themselves. So we've been poking around about things like concerts and real-time assessment, etc. but then we don't have quite the benefit of the prestige and the unions and the data collection. And I think actually there's some philosophical issues about whether we just want to argue that venues represented that. So I was just wondering if you could talk, mm. try to cut yourself short, specifically about but what, what, what performance PhDs yeah. are looking like. Yeah, well, um, rather than talk about the current context, because actually this is the least known to me, um, because of the time I've been at this institution, but um, I can talk about um, going back to my time in association with Leeds University, when they developed a, a not, not a DMA, but a PhD in performance. And one of my former stu uh, master students went on to do this uh, program. And it's, it's almost identical to what I described for the composer, uh, from my experience at York, which was that the, the requirement for the performer was to produce three hours worth of DVD recorded material, in fact, and to produce a short thesis, which was effectively a, a justification of what was being tackled in those particular performance works. And, but bearing in mind that the thesis itself wasn't really assessed. The thesis is an aid to the Viva Virtue, to an engagement with the student about what the intent was in, in performance. 
And this is absolutely central to the way that we've, we've developed the whole approach to practice-based research is that it's based on the individual's defense of uh, a proposition which they've explored through performance. So actually, it's very similar. There were very few differences in this. This particular student was um, perhaps even more challenging because he was a free, free improviser. In other words, there were no measures by which to even measure this work. You had to understand his own, the creation of his own language, which is what an improviser does, um, and to explore his theorization of that language and how he was exploring it in performance. So it was entirely, isolated, entirely focused on the individual. Uh, so the, the whole issue of reference point to that artist was largely non-existent. So it, was, it, it comes back to this point about defense of a position, an argument, and that's actually central to my understanding of um, research higher work it, as it is in the context in the, in the UK. So rather than measuring it against a set of norms or others' work, it is the work itself and the capacity of the individual to defend that work in the way of convincing argument about the intent.